Welcome to Expat Alaska. I'm your host, Thomas Higgins, and today we are speaking by phone from Spinarda del Sur in Randolph County, Alabama, with expat Alaskan spoken word and written word artist turned Alabama chicken rancher, Jackie Carr. Welcome, Jackie. Thanks, Thomas. For this inaugural Expat Alaskan interview, I have chosen Jackie not only for the interesting change that she's chose for her life, but also her connection with the Anchorage art community and with Out North. And after all, this is KONR Out North Art House Radio. Jackie performed an under 30 performance piece here in January of 2006 called Searching for Shade. So Jackie, I know how Alaskan Jackie Out North and Alabama all tether together. But for our listeners, could you tell us the connection? I lived in Alaska for 13 years up until the end of 2006. I'd done an under-30 piece for Out North, and I'd been to many shows there. I'd ushered there before. In fact, I remember sitting in in some of the very early meetings of KONR. My under-30 piece was about, among many things, my search for the family history, mostly on my dad's side. And I'm adopted, and doing my family history, it's not really doing my ancestral history, because I have no idea who my biological parents are. I did genealogy on my adopted family and got engrossed in it. I was just a little baby when I was adopted, so it's still like my family. This is still my, you know, my grandma and her family I'm researching, just not my ancestors. Growing up, I always had that feeling that, like a bazillion other kids, I guess, that I didn't belong, that I didn't fit in. I mean, how did I end up with these people, Jean and Ethel Carr? Surely some mistake had been made. I mean, why couldn't anybody recognize my genius? Most of my peers weren't impressed with my genius either. When I was eight, one of the older neighbor boys was giving me shit. You think you're so smart. You're not, you know. You're so stupid. In fact, you're so stupid, I bet you don't even know if you're adopted or not. And I had no idea what the word meant, but I wasn't about to let this asshole get the best of me. And I looked him squarely in the eye and said, duh, of course I'm adopted. What, what do I look like I'm not adopted? Jeez, you're the one who's stupid. And afterwards, I went home and I walked in the kitchen and said, hi, Mom, am I adopted? And her face white. One moment Ethel Carr was making dinner for her, for her family, and the next she was having a big conversation with her little girl. And she knelt down to face me and said that yes, I was adopted. But that was even better than regular because that meant they picked me out special from all those other babies and that they loved me just as much as if I hadn't been adopted. Probably even more. I still really w wasn't sure what it meant. But I knew one thing, that I had been right, and that little fucker had been wrong. <laughs> With the subject out in the open, one of my father's favorite threats became, you know, I saved the receipt from your adoption. I can still take you back and trade you in for a good kid. His version of I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> When I, when I find horrible things in my family tree, I can laugh at it because I'm not really related to those people. <laughs> in, you know, in my family tree, I'm actually my own fourth cousin. But I'm not really because I'm adopted, so I kind of feel really good about being adopted sometimes. <laughs> and I started to piece together my father's family tree. But as the pieces fell into place, an unusual pattern began to emerge. Branches of the tree twisted around, folding in on themselves, doubling back. It took months to sort it out, but eventually I did, and I realized that I didn't have a family tree. What I had was actually a family wreath. <laughs> My great-grandparents were second cousins. My grandparents were second cousins. My grandpa's brother, the one who got beat for not plowing the field, he married another second cousin. The daughter of two first cousins, and their daughter married my grandma's brother. My father is his own third cousin, which in a way makes me my own fourth cousin. Or as one relative puts it, we're not inbred, we're purebred. <laughs> 
A lot of, lot of cousin marriages in there. <laughs> so you acquired this land down in Alabama through the family. What was it that finally got you to relocate there? My dad owned the property after his mother died. He inherited it. But he lives in Michigan, him and my mom. So they weren't really doing anything with the land. And I, you know, he told me I didn't have to wait till he died to get it. He signed it over to me. And I was hesitant at first and second and third. <laughs> and I came down and looked at it. It's, you know, it's beautiful country and I've got this just incredible million dollar view sitting up on a hill I can see for 40 miles, 180 degrees. And I thought, you know, that I could do more of the family history, you know, it would be easier to do it from here than all the way in Alaska and I don't know at the time it seemed like a good idea. Has your art changed at all from your relocation? Oh, to be quite honest, I feel like this place has sapped all my creativity. It's, you know, I haven't written, you know, my blog has, hasn't even been touched in over a year. I, I fret about it a lot that I should be writing more. I thought that, you know, well, if I'm out in the country doing nothing, I'm going to be writing all the time. And that's just, that was a big lie. I have recently had this new artistic endeavor. I didn't really think of it as art, but other people were telling me it was about all the dead bones, <laughs> which I, I, uh, living in the country, you get, there's a lot of dead animals when you live in the country and you're a homesteader and they're your animals, they're wild animals, they're poor animals that get killed in the road. And, um, Angela Ramirez is really big into skulls. And so I would find a skull and I would clean it up, and I'd send it to her, and she'd send me something, you know, equally cool from Alaska. And then I ended up, I sent her so many skulls, she got kind of overflowed with them and told me to stop sending them. And, but I like skulls, too, and they started collecting up and other bones, and I've recently started selling these bones to uh, other people who like such things. And that was the, what is that called, a uh, do nanny? Uh, the Do Nanny. It's a big folk art festival down here, uh, about two hours south of me in Seal, Alabama. Seal is a, just another little southern town, just like the one I live in. But once a year, this crazy, wonderful music festival, art folk art festival happens. And I got a booth this year. I went last year for the first time and loved it so much. I went down, camped all weekend, had a booth, and brought all this stuff dead animal stuff that over the last six years <laughs> I've collected. People were almost throwing money at me. It was crazy. All my neighbors here think I'm insane, you know, because I would be collecting all these bones and such. And now they're, they're, I've just blown their minds that I walked away this weekend with like 400 bucks for all that stuff. And if you see Sheila, give her a big hug for me because she's the one who told me about Do Nanny. How did she know about that? There was an article about it in the New York Times. It happened, like, essentially in my backyard, and I had to find out about it from Sheila in Alaska, who read about it in the New York Times. But, yeah, she had sent me this article about, you know, this crazy folk art festival in East Alabama and this, you know, artist who, you know, owns the property. It's kind of like Sheila's annual, annual studio party times a million, you know. But there's no trebuchet. And, uh, but, yeah, she sent me the article, and she's like, isn't this near you? These seem like your kind of people. You should go to this. And, like, the first two years, there was some trouble with my car. You know, it was like I couldn't go on my own, and I couldn't talk anybody into going. You know, and most of the people here I know wouldn't want to go anyway. But, you know, I'd find, like, the one person, like, they would go. They would get this, you know, and they'd just... But last year I finally got someone to go with me. This year I got more people to go with me. But we went down Thursday night and stayed until, like, late Sunday afternoon, which, you know, that's, like, the longest I've been away from my house in a long time. I'm usually very closely tethered because of all the animals and stuff. You're listening to Expat Alaskan on KONR 106.1 LP. And we are here with Expat Alaskan, spoken word, written word, and under 30 performer turned Alabama chicken rancher, Jackie Carr. <laughs> An 
another thing for those of us who are in your Facebook and blog loop is your history of taking in wandering homeless chickens. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I've become the crazy chicken lady, too, here. I uh, always thought I'd, I'd end up as a crazy cat lady, but it turns out it's chickens. I live near a lot of these factory farms. They have these giant warehouses that hold 10,000 chickens, and there's I don't know how many of these things all over this county, but like millions of chickens pass through Randolph County. And I know some people who run these places, and when the trucks come in, and load up all the chickens to take them to the slaughterhouse, there's always like half a dozen, a dozen of them that just don't get scooped up. They're running around. And when they got 50,000 chickens on the truck, it's not worth it to chase 12 down. So these farmers will call me, and I'll come chase the chickens down, and then I bring them home and raise them to be happy free-range chickens. And I've even had a couple factory farm chickens that fell off trucks and found their way to my house on their own. (laughs) The little underground chicken railroad to my house. And I had a four-legged chicken. I had two four-legged chickens. They were my little pride and joy, my four-legged chickens. They are no longer with me for reasons that had nothing to do with their four legs. My first one was Fordor Dostoevsky, and he died of, he had a heart attack. And he had two hearts. It was freaky. Ah. Both of my four-legged chickens came from big factory farms. Those chickens have bad heart and bad feet. So the first one died of a bad heart. And then the second one, uh, her name was Susie Quattro, and she died of a respiratory infection that actually killed 15 of my birds. It was very sad. I guess we can derive uh, one of your favorite authors and one of your favorite musicians from those two birds. (laughs) Well, actually, I also, most of my factory farm hens, since they all look the same, and when you have 20 of them running around, you can't tell them apart. I usually just, they, they get named Ellen. All my chicken house chickens are named Ellen because all my animals have to have names. And they all got named Ellen after, just you brought up the literary reference, um, they all got named Ellen after the character Ellen James from The World According to Garp by John Irving. So down on the farm, you got chickens. 23 chickens, 8 goats, 4 cats, and a dog. And your dog seems to have a liking for eggs? Yes, she loves eggs. She steals all the eggs. She's probably eating a dozen eggs a day by now. I I hardly ever get any. I know of one chicken nest that apparently she doesn't know where it is. So I'm hoping it stays that way. Otherwise, I'll never get any eggs all summer. She's really good with the chickens. I'd rather her eat the eggs than the chickens. She's very good with the chickens. I told the dog she couldn't stay unless she was good with the chickens. And I imagine that if uh, she, since she knows where her dinner comes from, that she'll be protective of those chickens too if anything <laughs> comes wandering around. Yep, her job is to, she's, her, she's head of security. She's supposed to help keep the possums and raccoons and coyotes and other dogs away. There's a lot of things out in those woods want to eat my chickens. And what about the snakes? Yeah, well, it's not quite snake season yet. I don't think she's ever encountered a snake. She's not even a year old yet. So you got her as a pup? I found her and five siblings. They were all, somebody dumped them out in the woods. You know, they were little puppies, and they dumped them out in the middle of nowhere. And I happened to be driving down this dirt road, and there were five of them living in a drainage ditch under the road. And I kept bringing food by for a couple days and never saw a mother, and they were just skin and bones. So I didn't want a dog, and the animal shelter would only take three of them. And so I got stuck with two of them, couldn't find homes for them, because everybody around here is always trying to get rid of a dog or a cat. So I had two, Ruckus and Melee, and Ruckus unfortunately passed, but I still have Melee, and she's a very happy, well-adjusted hyper dog. The universe last year kept insisting that I had a dog. It was throwing dogs at me all the time, and this one stuck. <laughs> Is there any farming involved down there on the ranch? Um, actually, not so much anymore. Last year was the first year that I made the decision not to, like, try and grow anything other than, like, some stuff. You know, I, I tended some stuff that came back from the previous year, and I have some fruit trees and stuff. But I work for this local farm, CSA, 
and we get all this other uh, organic food from other regional farms and provide it to people in Atlanta mostly. I get so much food from there because I'm always getting to take home, like, that tomato's got a spot on it, this, you know, this fruit is blemished, whatever. So I get, I would bring home in one week more tomatoes than my plants would put out all summer. And it was just like, why am I even doing this anymore? So fortunately, I don't have to do that so much anymore. And this CSA carries tons of not just fruit and vegetables, but other farms provide it with, like, meat and cheese and grains and all kinds of good stuff. So I get most of my groceries from there now, which is good because farming is back-breaking work. I grew a lot of my own food the first few years here. And what about for the uh, animals on the farm? What are Do you farm for them at all? Well, the goats, their their main purpose was to eat the kudzu, this horribly invasive plant that my property's covered in. And so they've completely devoured all the kudzu in their five-acre pasture, but I don't have the fence to build around other kudzu. But they keep that clean over there. And I've, I've sold some, some goats in the past. I get baby goats every year. But I don't milk them or anything. But when I first moved here, I kind of fantasized about that, and I'll make my own cheese, and it never happened. And the chickens, I collect eggs from them. I rarely, rarely ever eat them. And I never kill them just to eat them. They become really kind of like pets, and then you feel weird about eating them. I get eggs from them, or did, till I got the dog. And the cats, the cats help keep the rodent population down. So everybody has a job here to do. You're, you're not writing anymore. How about the adopted family? Have you investigated there further? Um, I've found out more since I've been here. My family history down here in Randolph County, Alabama, is really kind of the history of the region. These people all moved, and not just my family, but all the families around here, they, they moved here 150 years ago and they never left. And they're all intertwined together now. I find pieces of the puzzle here and there still. Whenever I find an old timer around here with a certain last name, I always end up hassling them for like, who was your grandmother? Who was your grandfather? Do you remember so-and-so? You know, I like collecting the old stories still, and there were some buildings on the property where I live now, and so there were a lot of things I cleaned out of those, the house and barn that helped piece together bits of family history, and I always wanted to be an archaeologist when I grew up. I was constantly digging for artifacts to add to the collection, looking for my next big find. In the woods across the street from where we lived, I heard about a house that burned down in the 40s. And I spent a summer locating the site and then excavating mounds of charred debris I found buried just beneath the forest floor. I still have artifacts from that dig, too. An ashtray with the name of a real estate agency and a soup spoon. I never did tell my dad about that dig. The old man had a real talent for sucking the joy out of things I loved, and I didn't need him wrecking archaeology, too. <laughs> and so I've kind of got to play my uh, archaeology fantasy out here a bit digging up all kinds of stuff up out of the dirt, even, you know, even though a lot of it's not really worth anything. But I get all excited if I find an old jar. Just a couple weeks ago, I found part of a 1930s Plymouth hubcap after a rain. I got all excited. It's not worth anything, but... <laughs> Back in your under 30s searching for shade, there was a homestead, there was a cemetery... How does that reflect with the land that you are presently occupying? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got all distracted by the dog barking at something. Hold on a second. What are you barking at? No, you can't come inside. Not right now. Sorry, I heard a chicken make a noise, and then the dog barked, and I was like, what is it? Oh, but I guess it's nothing. I'm sorry. Ask the question again. <laughs> well, at least I didn't hear any gunfire. As <laughs> Yeah, I was I was on the phone with somebody, and one of my neighbor's dogs, I saw them coming down on my property, and I just wanted to fire, you know, a shot off to scare them off. And so I just had to tell the person on the other line, like, hold on a second, got to fire a warning shot. I thought, it, you know, I'd say something before I, you know, shot the gun off next to the phone. It was just one of those things I would have never said at any other point in my life except, you know, now that I live in Alabama. So prior to moving to Alabama, you wouldn't have gave a warning shot? <laughs> I wouldn't have shot at anything. I never even known a gun until I moved to Alabama. And I mainly only have a gun to scare things away from my chickens. 
Back in your under 30 searching for shade, there was a homestead, there was a cemetery. How does that reflect with the land that you are presently occupying? Well, the, the land that I talked about in my under 30 piece was the original family homestead from a branch of my family that got here in Alabama in the 1820s. That particular homestead is maybe like 25, 30 miles south of me. My uh, under 30 piece had been also about how I found the old Mitchum homestead that nobody knew where it was. There was an old cemetery on the property that had been destroyed in the 50s, but all the graves were still there. And I've since been in contact finally with the person who owns that property, and she's related to that branch of the family too, but she didn't know all that stuff was on her property. And that same branch of my family, they later moved a little further up north in the county. And the land I live on, they've been here since like the 1850s. Everybody around me is related to me. We all descend from like this one guy who owned this property a long time ago. Everybody's related to everybody here. Jackie, since uh, I described you as the Alabama chicken rancher, you you got a more precise name? I used to like the name Chicken Whisperer, but there's some other guy who calls himself that, and he's got a radio show and such, so I don't call myself that anymore. <laughs> a lot of people around here just always call me the Chicken Lady, which I never really liked Chicken Lady because I always think of that Kids in the Hall sketch about Chicken Lady. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's not flattering. No, but uh, if it's anything like the crazy cat lady from The Simpsons, uh... <laughs> well, I'd rather be more like that than the chicken lady from the Kids in the Hall sketch. That that is seriously disturbing. Then <laughs> almost makes me want to go watch the Kids in the Hall for the first time in my life. <laughs> well, what are you? God, you're not too bright. I'm a chicken lady. A chicken lady. Yep, yeah, and I love life. Do you love life? Oh yeah. I thought you might. Because I put that in my personal Latin. Chicken lady loves life. Gee, I never took that literally. I never No? <laughs> I never, <laughs> never really took ch ch chicken lady literally. <laughs> oh, you're not too bright. No. Well, just the way I like them. A lot of people here just call me the chicken lady. Though with this new, you know, not new, but my more expanded bone and skull operation. I may end up being known more for that. I do already have some neighbors that will call me and let me know when there's roadkill nearby. You know, they'll call me like, oh, there's a possum just got hit up by the four-way stop. You should get it. <laughs> uh, it's good to have neighbors. <laughs> but who's laughing now? Now I have $400 from selling all that stuff. You're listening to Expat Alaskan on KONR 106.1 LP. And we are here with Expat Alaskan, spoken word, written word, and under 30 performer turned Alabama chicken rancher, Jackie Carr. <laughs> You are in Randolph County, is that correct? Yes, Randolph County, where alcohol sales have finally been legalized for the first time in over 100 years. It's on the ballot like every election, and every year it would lose. But over the years, it would lose by a smaller and smaller amount. This year, it finally passed. There's still a lot of people crying about how the devil's been let into Randolph County and such. But, but now I only have to drive 11 miles for cheap, crappy beer round trip used to be like 50 miles round trip to get beer. And for good beer? How far do you got to go? South of the county border, which is like 50 miles round trip. They usually carry like, you can find one or two six packs of Sweetwater, which is an Atlanta microbrew, um, which is very good, by the way. This is Bud Country, Miller, Natural Light. Yep. Corona is considered pretty exotic here. Exotic, fancy beer here. Just over the mountain, you have the Talladega Speedway, so... I've never been to it. I actually would like to go just once, just for the, you know, experience. Since I've moved here, I've tried to do what I call authentic rural southern experiences. So Talladega Raceway really wouldn't be rural, I guess, but... 
like since I've moved here, I've been to a cockfight and I've um, helped butcher hogs and I've eaten chitlins. A lot of the Southerners don't do that stuff here anymore. But there's like, I like finding the old time. I've, I've helped make moonshine. <laughs> I got I got one of the locals to trust me enough showed me his still. Green fried tomatoes? I've already had green fried tomatoes though before I moved here. But I you know, I'd never been to a cockfight and when I got invited to one it was like I'm probably never gonna get a chance to go to another one. You're not gonna be invited back? Why did you win too much or <laughs> I, you know, I spoil my chickens too much. I, I could never put one in the ring. I just, oh, I'd want to stop the fight. My poor baby's getting hurt. Cockfighting really went down the tubes here after there was a big arrest. They arrested like 250 people at a cockfight like two miles from my house. And that kind of busted up all the fun for the cockfighters here. But, you know, I don't think I ever would have gotten into cockfighting, but... I had a number of cockfighters who told me after they saw how good I was with chickens, they would have hired me to help take care of their roosters. But everybody always, come, you know, was all screaming about how inhumane cockfighting was. And it's like, you know, I'm not, you know, condoning cockfighting. I'm not. But millions of birds in Randolph County are living in these horrible, horrible conditions in these giant warehouses, and they're all concerned about these 50 roosters. I spent a little time working in a factory farm chicken warehouse, and I've seen, you know, and I've adopted birds from a cockfighter. You know, I've been over. I've seen how their birds are taken care of, and I would rather be a fighting cock any day than a broiler hen any day of the week. Yeah, if they're out there doing the exercise, they obviously got better hearts than those uh, chickens that you spoke of. Oh, yeah. Oh, I call those, those big factory farms, I call them the concentration coops. It's awful in there. This is Katie Cobbing, and you're listening to the Right Radio Station, 106.1 LPKONR, Out North Art House Radio. You're listening to Expat Alaskan on KONR 106.1 LP, and we are here with Expat Alaskan, spoken word, written word, and under 30 performer turned Alabama chicken rancher Jackie Carr. Have you done any more work, uh, or have you had you expanded at all on your under 30 piece regarding the family? Um, you know, I haven't, but it's I you know I've, I've thought of 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 the under 30 pieces a lot in the sense that, you know, like I was saying, like how I've just been so uncreative and I'm not writing anything. And eventually I'm coming back to Alaska. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I have to believe I'm coming back to Alaska. And part of me is like, well, I got to have something to show when I get back there. And I feel like I got to at least have an under 30 piece to show for like what I did when I was here. Cause I said, I'd have all this time to write. So I, I kind of feel like I can't come back unless I have another under 30 piece ready to go. <laughs> or a novel or... Something, something. I don't know. Hopefully the words will come soon. I, I just need to start writing again, you know, get back on that horse. Once I start doing it again, hopefully I'll keep doing it. But I've just been, I don't know. It's kind of a depressing life down here. I've just been being, you know, depressed, living in a crappy trailer and feeling guilty about not writing more. My room in the basement was where I spent countless hours, nights, weeks, months contemplating my life and how much it sucked. Basement was also where I found papers about my adoption, tucked away in the drawer of my parents' old desk. Said my birth parents were Irish and Welsh. She was 18, worked as a secretary. He was 19, a soldier. I was born August 7th, 1968 in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and that is about all I know. But I would lie in bed and listen to my records and dream about what my real parents were like. What did I get from them? My hair? My eyes? Is that where my genius comes from? As far as your under 30 piece, what prompted you to do it initially? And what kind of transfer do you ha did you bring into that from your other arts? Initially, it was me. I can't remember if it was Gene or Jay that asked me first 
they approached me about doing an under 30 piece and they were, um, it was the first year they were going to do a theme, like the three pieces would have something in common. And that year it was fathers. And I just remember Gene or Jay coming up to me at some point going, so I hear you have an interesting relationship with your father or something like that. And he was like, you, you want to do an under 30 piece about it? And I was just getting ready to come down for a vacation to Alabama to go try and find the old family homestead cemetery that nobody knew about. And um, I said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And I knew my under 30 piece was going to largely be about whatever happened on this trip. But, you know, until the trip was over, I had no idea how the under 30 piece would end. So I went on the trip and I went and trekked out in the woods with my aerial map and went out to go find the old cemetery. And my dad came along with me, even though I didn't want him to. Because I'd always wanted to be an archaeologist like Indiana Jones. I was like, yeah, it was Indiana Jones, all right. But this time it was the third movie where his dad followed him around the whole time saying stuff like, you know, we named the dog Indiana. Yeah, so me and my dad, we kind of have a contentious relationship. And that was largely what my under 30 piece was about. As far as, like, other other work I'd done and how that applied to under 30, most of the other stuff I'd done, at least live like that, was I did a lot of poetry slams and stuff, but you're only on stage for three minutes. Maybe, you know, if you're lucky, two or three times that night, but just three minutes. And, you know, under 30, it was like, it's called under 30, but everybody always goes to, like, 29, 30 minutes. Nobody ever goes, like, oh, I only need to be on stage for 10 minutes. <laughs> And so, you know, to be up alone on stage for 30 minutes is crazy. That's like 10 times longer than three minutes. I I don't know how much I brought from Poetry Slam into my under 30 piece, but it it was definitely a big change being stared at for 30 whole straight minutes. Part of the thing of with under 30 is it's to get people out of their comfort zone, which it sounded like you definitely did. Did you learn something from that experience as well? Besides, yeah. don't ever do it again. <laughs> no, actually, actually, I, I really enjoyed doing it. I had a great time. And um, that year they had brought up, to work with all the under 30 artists, they brought up David Drake, who was wonderful. I feel He helped me so much with my piece, I feel like he should get like a writing credit on it. He was great to work with. So I learned I learned a lot from David just about, you know, writing longer pieces like that and little stage hints. And and I actually ended up getting some more, a um, few more acting gigs out of that that I did my final year in Alaska, which was a whole lot of fun. Shotzi Schaefer's had seen me in the under 30 performance and she was getting ready to do one of her foreplay productions at Out North. She asked me if I wanted to have a part in one of them. And so I got to be the drunken, drug-addled, jobless loser sister of uh, Mark Robicoff's lead character. (laughs) And that was a lot of fun because I I hadn't done a play since I was like in first grade. And I got a TV commercial then out of that too where I got to play a cave woman. (laughs) If our listeners out there are interested in getting involved in this, one of the benefits of getting on board early with Under, Under 30 is you get to work with artists that come into town. Oh, yeah, they, you know, I, I'm assuming they still do something like that where they would bring up someone to help us. It, would, it was kind of part of our payment. You get to work with this, you know, world-class artist to work on your piece. This is a workshop that would cost you hundreds of dollars, you know, elsewhere if you were to, like, sign up for something like that. You know, it was great getting to work with David. Yes, uh, David had done a piece on his ancestry of being a uh, heir of Dracula. Yep, he he had done his piece, Son of Dracula, at Out North. And, of course, he's very well known for his show, from which is like 20 years old now, I think, The the Night Larry David Kisses Me. The Night Larry Kramer Kissed Me. Not Larry David. (laughs) Was that a Freudian slip of some sort? Yeah, the the, the name of his, his most famous show is The Night Larry Kramer Kissed Me. Larry David is the guy who created Seinfeld. (laughs) <laughs> David Drake, he you know he did the ancestry thing you know with Son of Dracula and my piece Searching for Shade was also ancestry searching related and so we bonded a lot over that and would talk about 
stuff like that. I don't know. That just reminded me of that. I hadn't thought of that in a while. So if anybody out there is listening is is thinking, hey, I want to do something like that, contact out north, and the sooner you get on board, uh, the more opportunities you have to work with people, polish it. Oh, I highly recommend it to anyone who has something to say on the stage like that. Out North is a great place to get involved and meet other like-minded people who are also interested in these things. You know, it's like you don't have to be some professional actor or writer to do these under 30s. That's the beauty of it. We have people do them who've never, ever, ever set foot on a stage. I remember when George Harper did one about coming out for the first time and, he, you know, when he was already older and... George wasn't an actor at all. I love the Under 30 series. I'm so proud to have been a part of it. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but just uh, in January, two weeks before Under 30, Wendy Withrow had to drop out. And I, I ha- didn't know that. Yep, and I happened to be in the building, so they came to me and said, hey, you want to do an Under 30? Not tech, do you want to do an Under 30? <laughs> So I said no for three days while I secretly wrote. So after I thought I had enough material to show to the audience, I said, yeah, I'll do it. Well, after a few rehearsals, I realized, all right, this is getting short. So I added on to it. And then after the opening night, I go, it's getting even shorter. So (laughs) I added another piece in for the second weekend. Well, I mean, I I remember I knew like six months before that I was going to do it. I had six months to do this, but I couldn't, you know, it was still like another month before the trip happened that so much of the piece was about. So that first month, I didn't even know how the, you know, what it was going to be about. And then I wrote so many different versions of it. It didn't come together until the last minute, I think, you know, because I I know like I just had this jumble of papers when David Drake showed up. It was like a half written I, I don't think I had any kind of finalized version until I, you know, it was like you were yelling at me for like needing lighting cues or something. I was like, okay, I guess I will write this. Ah. Me? Yelling? <laughs> well, maybe not yelling. Maybe not yelling. Needing. I, was, I, I always turn stuff in at the last minute. But I had fun. I pulled it off. There was other ideas that I'm thinking, hey, this will go on in there too. This could go on there too. As like you were saying with um, working with David, he helped you with a lot with stage and staging and stuff that you were not aware of at all before as far as how to create it. You knew what you liked, I'm sure, when you saw it on stage. I'd, I'd work backstage on a couple things or, you know, maybe, like, help paint a set. But as far as, like, any, like, I never really did any stage stuff beyond poetry slams or maybe, you know, just some reading. But I'm, like, on stage for three minutes. Maybe, I think, you know, there was probably a couple events where maybe I was on stage for five But, you know, it's just like a whole other world now where it's like, well, I got lighting cues and I got props. It's a whole new world for me. And David was really good about helping me through a lot of that. Yeah, I was writing thinking that, too. That was part of my writing was I don't want to put something up that is just words. I wanted to have action into it. I wanted to make as much of a theater event out of it as well. Yeah, that was it for me. I don't want to just get up there and, like, read poetry or something. I just, you know, I'm, that's not what I'm doing. You know, I wanted it to be a, a story and theatrical. And since it was just me on stage, it's like I have to somehow create some sort of action. It was terrifying and exhilarating and so worthwhile. I'm so glad I did it. I'm so glad they asked me because I don't know if I would have on my own thrown my hat into the ring to do it. You know, just kind of thinking like, oh, I can't do that. I've never done anything like that. Let's leave that to the professional actors. So glad that that I did it. I'm just trying to do some type of adaptation from your clothing line on your uh, Searching for Shade. My father had given me a family. I kind of gave him one back. To be honest, that, that, that ending, I always thought that was overly schmaltzy. And I just put that in there because it seemed like something an audience would like. I don't know. I still think it's kind of overly schmaltzy. I always thought that end was a little more, you know, lifetime network than my normal writing. So it's it's sundown there then, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and as, I, as I recall living in Southern California, it doesn't vary but an hour or two between uh, winter and summer when you're that far south. Yeah, it's the increments are so small, too, daily. You know, like in Alaska, it's like five minutes a day you're gaining or losing. And here it's like, oh, we gained... Two seconds. 
you don't really notice it as much. You know, I, 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 I will admit I do enjoy it being warm out and dark at the same time. That's something I never really got to, you know, do in Alaska. You know, you couldn't go out in your short and T-shirts and go look at the stars. You know, I saw the I saw the northern lights from my yard once. Well, they were really faint and they were red because normally, like the you know the weak northern lights are just green, and these were red. It was like I think it was last year there was some big giant northern lights extravaganza, and people were seeing it you know further south than usual. And I just happened to be outside with my neighbor. You know, it wasn't the most impressive Northern Lights display by any means, except for the fact that it was this far south. And, um, I mean, I'm like just a little, a hair further south than Atlanta. So, Jackie, uh, where was, where is, and where will be home? Oh, Alaska will always be home. Of every place I've ever lived, no place felt like home to me more than Spinard. I would love if I could someday figure out some way to live in Alaska, at least in the summertime, and then have this place to come to for maybe like January, February, March, you know, to come down here. I'd miss under 30, but I'd also miss a big chunk of the winter. (laughs) You know, I mean, I like the property down here. It's nice to have it, you know, not that far from Atlanta. It's a big hub. You could travel to anywhere from there. But, no, the plan has always been to eventually come back to Alaska. I just don't know when that's going to happen. Maybe next year. Maybe next year I'll make even more money at Dune Annie if I play my cards right and I can buy a ticket home for at least a couple weeks. Okay, don't don't go getting uh, skeletons nefariously just to uh, get back to Alaska. I easily come by enough honest skeletons that I don't, I'll I'll never kill something just to sell its bones. And most of the stuff I sell, I didn't kill. It just died. But if it tried to kill my chickens, I might have killed it. All right. With that, good night, Jackie. Well, it's been great talking to you. It's always it's always good to hear a voice from home. And see you up here sometime, maybe. Eh, maybe not, because it looks like I'm about out of here myself. So. Well, we will meet somewhere down the trail. You have been listening to Expat Alaskan, the inaugural episode with Jackie Carr, spoken word, written word artist, under 30 performer, now residing in self-imposed exile at uh, Spanardo del Sur in Randolph County, Alabama. I'd like to thank you, Jackie, for joining us on this inaugural edition of Expat Alaskan. Thanks. I had a great time. This has been Expat Alaskan, a production of Out North Art House Radio, KONR 106.1 LP.